Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Let me allow you so you can. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're going to get started again, and we'll start off with a talk by Seeing Fu uh, on diversification of the water cricket genus Velia, uh, Heteroptera geromorpha veliidae in Eurasia. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Seeing Fu from Nankai University, and today I'm going to share you with my study diversification of water creek genus Vilia in Eurasia. Um, and I would like to introduce this topic in five aspects, a background of the Eurasia and Vilia, aim of this study, materials and methods, results and the discussion, and the conclusions. Um, for the background, uh, the first is about the geological reconstructions of Eurasia. Uh, Eurasia was formed through a series of pilot movements, and the major tectonic events began in the Eastern. About uh, 15 million years ago, uh, India moved northward about 2,000 kilometers from its original position, position and uh, uh, collided with Asia. Uh, this collision uh, event promoted the uplift of the uh, Tibetan plate, uh, plateau. And uh, during the Oligocene and the uh, TSS retreated intensively and the freshwater habitats appeared with the strong change in sea level. Uh, and at the eastern to Oligocene boundary, uh, the southern Mediterranean was created at the western end of the TSS. And the, inter, uh, and, uh, the interplay between the tectonic plates and the Titan retreated uh, leading to the Central Asia aridity. And uh, at the final stage of the uplift of the Tibetan Plateau, uh, the rapid uplift of Hongduan Mountains began. Uh, and the uh, quaternary period has the cyclic growth and the decay of the continental ice sheet. Uh, for example, uh, much of the European plate was covered by glaciers during the Ice Age, uh, which are the white color parts on the top of the picture, um, and the red color parts uh, on the top uh, on the picture are the main refuges in Europe, uh, like the uh, Iberian Peninsula, the Italian Peninsula, and the Balkans. Uh, well, uh, Asia has ice caps only in the northeast and uh, Tibet, uh, Tibetan uh, plateaus regions, and the main uh, refuges in Hongduan mountain area and the southeast coast of China and uh, so on. And uh, Eurasia also has multiple uh, range center of species diversification. Uh, for example, in the Mediterranean, uh, region species diversification is mostly related to sea level changes and the conversion of fresh water and the cell water uh, habitats. And uh, in the Central Asia, uh, aridity is the main factor affected the fragmentation of widely distributed species habitats and also promoted the expansion of the drought tolerant taxa. Uh, in Asia, the 
uh, rapid uh, differentiation and accumulation of species is often related to the mountain uplifts. Uh, so uh, we choose the genus Vilia as a common uh, semi-aquatic bugs from streams and rivers as an object of this study. Uh, it is a kind of a gregarious insects inhabiting shared uh, uh, shade areas of streams where they feed on died or drowning insects floating on the water surface. Uh, three subgenera are currently recognized within Vilia. Uh, and diagnosed in particular by the wing forms, a uh, length of the first antennal segment and other characters, uh, which are the subgenus uh, Vilia, uh, subgenus uh, uh, Plasovilia, and subgenus Cisavilia. Uh, and uh, the distribution of Vilia is throughout the temperature and the subtical parts of the palatic region. Uh, the subgenus Avilia is the monotypally for Avilia revolum, uh, which has a Western Mediterranean distribution. Uh, and uh, another subgenus, plus Avilia, contains all remaining uh, West uh, palatic species, about 28 taxa, uh, distributed uh, from the uh, Europe, Northern Africa, uh, Trans uh, Transcaucasia, and so on. Uh, and Cisavilia has an oriental range in the highlands of the southern and uh, southeastern Asia. Most of the Chennai species of Cisavilia are known only from their type or localities. Um, and by uh, constructing the phylogenetic relationship between the subgenera and uh, estimating the divergence time for major lineages, uh, we want to explore the biogeographical uh, history of it. And the map shows where the samples were collected. Uh, and uh, we uh, globally uh, sample about 17 species of Velia. And uh, we combine the ultra conserved elements and the certain uh, mitochondrial protein coding genes data site from the uh, an aseno uh, preserved specimens to illustrate the phylogenetic relationships uh, and the evolutionary history among the three uh, among the three subgenera. And we also uh, conducted the divergence time estimation, uh, the diversification analysis, uh, analysis, and the ancestral habitat reconstruction and other analyze. Uh, and uh, uh, for the result, uh, we got the mitochondrial genomes of 27 species. Uh, the length of Vilia mitogenome is about uh, 14,600 uh, base pair uh, without the length of the control region. Uh, and we did not find the gene rearrangement in this genus. Uh, for the UCE data sets, we generated 60 simple and uh, recovered a total of 2,548 UCE loci uh, with an average length about uh, 60 and, uh, six, six, uh, 634 base pair. Uh, and we finally choose the 70 uh, percentage, uh, percentage my uh, metrics to conduct the subsequent analysis. Uh, for the phylogenetic uh, reconstructions, uh, we use the ML, uh, BI summary based and site based methods to uh, analyze the phylogenetic relationships. And our results suggested that uh, the monophly of the genus Vilia and supported the sister group between the subgenus Vilia and the Cisa Vilia. Uh, when we match the phylogenetic results to the sampling site, uh, we found that the subgenus Cisavilia and the Vilia are geographically uh, distant, but are the sister groups to each other. And for this, theory, uh, for this reason, we have explored the historical causes of the above pattern. Uh, first, we use the MCMC tree to estimate uh, the divergence times by using the UCE data sites. Uh, with carefully selected fossils as the calibration points. Uh, Vilia orig originated in the early Moison, and the first divergence of Plasovilia from the remaining clays 
uh, was at about uh, 19.2 million years ago. And the separation uh, between Velia and the Sisa Velia occurred uh, about uh, 30 million years ago. And after that, the rapid species uh, differentiation occurred in Sisa Velia over a short period of, of time and within the about uh, 3 million years, uh, which, uh, uh, which is consistent uh, with the timing of the final uplift of Hengduan Mountains. Uh, and we also reconstructed the uh, dynamics of species uh, diversification using the BMM method. Uh, the overall rate of species that, uh, differentiation uh, in Velia was highest at 22, uh, 21 to 22 million years ago and, and has been decreasing since then uh, and showing a small rebound at around two million years ago. Uh, and the mean failure rate plot shows that uh, compared with the Palacio Vilia, uh, the Sisa Vilia, uh, especially the taxa distributed near the Hengduan Mountain in China, continues to maintain a high rate of the differentiation. Uh, and the ancestral habitat reconstruction uh, showed that the DC model could be the uh, best, mode, uh, best model for the evolution, uh, evolution for uh, Vilia. Uh, in the early Moison, the ancestral taxa of the genus Vilia are found in Europe. And in the late Moison, uh, the subgenus Sisa Vilia diverged from the uh, sub, uh, subgenus Vilia by an occurrence event. Um, and uh, we also reconstructed the uh, ancestral climatic niche. Uh, results show that the subgenera Cisavilia and Plasovilia are clearly differentiated under the influence of the ecological factors uh, related to the precipitation. And in contrast to the Plasovilia, uh, the Cisavilia is found in regions with more precipitation and uh, higher temperatures. And combining the above results, uh, where we presume that uh, the ancestral groups of the genia Vilia mainly distributed in Europe continent. And uh, in the oligocene, uh, the changes of the titan affected the marine habitats and created new fresh water, uh, which facilitated the expansion of ancestral group. Uh, and uh, during the Moison, uh, because of the aridity in the Central Asia, the ancestral groups migrate to eastern and the western side with the subgen uh, with the subgenera uh, differentiation, and uh, along with the increasing aridification, uh, habitat fragmentation produce further divergence uh, between the subgenus Vilia and the subgenus Sisa Vilia. Uh, and then, uh, because of the ancestor of the subgenus Vilia uh, had well developed femur and wings. Um, it had a strong ability to migrate long distance. So after 30 million years ago, uh, the subgenera Vilia gradually migrated to Europe. And uh, we're after uh, within the subgenus Sisa Vilia, uh, in particular, the taxa distributed in the Southwest China underwent a rapidly adaptive radiation uh, within three million years. Uh, and uh, to find the effects of the last glacial period on space distribution, uh, we also analyzed the historical uh, 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 demographic changes and the ecological niche modeling uh, of it. And the results show uh, that the fitness boom of the subgenus plus ovilia contracted towards to the Mediterranean region during the LGM period, uh, while, the, uh, while the potential uh, while the potential distribution area of subgenus Cisavilia has not changed much. And uh, the uh, demographic history analysis showed uh, that uh, most species of Vilia experienced the significant population fluctuation during the last gla uh, glacial period. Uh, and so now I summarize uh, the conclusion of our study. Uh, first, uh, our research 
supported the monopoly of Genia Sevilla and uh, uh, support the uh, really uh, support the sister relationship between Cesar Villa and uh, Cesar uh, uh, and Villa. And we think uh, a reality of the Central Asia and the uplift of the Hengduan Mountains were the main factors affecting the species differentiation of Genia Sevilla. Uh, and uh, and third, during the last glacial period, uh, most species of Velia experienced a significant population fluctuation. Uh, and uh, in our study, uh, when we uh, compared the fellow genetic results based, the, uh, uh, based on the natural genome and the UCE data sets, uh, we also found discordance between them only in the Cisavilia. Uh, and we think it might be caused by the mitochondrial capture, and we will do more analyze, uh, analysis to figure it out. And uh, at last, I sincerely thank my advisor, uh, Wen Junbu and uh, Zheng Ye, uh, who gave me this chance to participate in this meaningful conference. And I also thank our uh, cal uh, collaborators, uh, Dr. Birch, for supporting and uh, identification specimens. And uh, they are uh, the always on my content, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Is there any questions? Is it on? No questions? Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, this, next we will hear from Ching Wang Zeng uh, talking about the integrative taxonomy of the water strider Potomometra hemiptera gerardi. <laughs> We're just getting things uh, set up with the video and uh, sharing the screen. Uh, okay. I'm trying to share my. Okay, something. So far, so good. Not just good afternoon. 
I'm a postdoctor from Nankai University. Uh, my name is Chen Guangzheng. It's my honor to make the oral presentation at this meeting. Now I would like to present my work, Integrative Taxonomy of the Water Strider Potomacher. My presentation will cover the following aspects. The species of Potomacher are big semi-aquatic bugs belonging to Hemiptera, Peter Abutera, Germanomorpha, Charidae, Potilomarine. The genus Potomacher is so far uh, considered endemic to China, mainly disputed around the Sichuan Basin, except that Montandonia exists to the east in the Dabi Mountains, and some populations of Baradotki spread northward to the Taihang Mountains. The species of Potomacher inhabit in secluded environment of quartz of fast falling mountain or streams with dense forest cover at medium elevations. Here, we provide five typical habits from different sets, and these photos were taken during our field work. Compared with other water bugs, the history of, the history of taxonomic studies on Potomacher is uncomplicated. Only a few publications exist on this genus. Initially, Bianchi placed the genus in the subfamily Halibutin because of its shortened abdomen. However, according to Burgos, this genus did not belong to Halibutin. Isaki erected the subfamily Potilomarin in the family Jaredae and placed the Potomatra in this subfamily, in this subfamily based on morphology. Drake and uh, Oberlin revised the genus, including four species, Brazotki, Marcosis, Montandonia, and uh, Tipitensis. More than 40 years later, one new species, Linearary, was described by the Chin. And therefore, the genus currently comprises five normal species. Although this genus has undergone a relatively long history of taxonomic studies based on morphology, since the description of the first normal species in the 19th century. It had never been, it had never been studied outside of the context of taxonomic, uh, taxonomic work. And as a result, little is known of his hidden species diversity and the phylogenetic relationships between the putative species. We have done a lot of field work to collect samples of this species for many years. And now the samples we collected is basically cover the entire distribution range of the genus. Then we identified these samples according to the literature and matched the preliminary species classification results to the map. We found that the five described species of Podmetra are particularly distributed in southwestern China, mainly around the Sichuan Basin. The morphologic characters of the samples distributed in the south of the basin are different from those of all the five described species. And we speculated that they may be potential new species. We call them SP1 and SP2 initially. Then we conducted a morphologic comparison between the two potential new species and the five described species. For female adults, the outgrowth at in the apical angle of Handcoxa and the backward projection of abdominal target one are morphological identification phasors between species. The morphological phasors of the two potential new species are most similar to macrosis. The abdominal target one of the four species, Brazovsky, Linovari, Tiptensis, and the Montandonia, with backward production on hand margin. While for the three species, Marcosis, SP1, and SP2, the abdominal target one without backward production on hand margin. The hand cox outgrowth of SP1 is longer than that of Marcosis, and the outgrowth of SP2 is shorter than that of Marcosis. For, for male adults, 
the morphologic identification features between species are mainly in genital segment. But the file describes the species. Interspecific differences in genital segments are significant. The genital segments of SP1 and SP2 are similar with macrocosis. Then, when conducted a detailed comparison among species based on parameters, including the dorsal lateral wheel, dorsal wheel, winter lateral wheel, and the winter wheel, the dorsal wheel of these parameters exhibits the largest differences among species. There are distinct differences among the five described species. The parameters of SP1 and SP2 are similar to mercosis, but there are also slight differences which are smaller than those between the five described species. Yeah, I'm on a bunch of those, so that's why I don't have it. But the screen is still. Can you hear us? We can see your screen. Can you hear us though? Or do I just need to hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Or we can let it happen. <laughs> can you hear? Can you hear? Sorry, we are going to change a computer to continue our work. Sorry, you can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, can you hear
Yeah, that was the sound. Oh, you're just gonna pass out. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, computer, and this is a Jim Wondren's presentation. Sorry. The problems of the internet. Yeah. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, we're starting. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. 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 Sorry.
supporting the monopoly of seven highly supported clays, corresponding to five described species and two undescribed taxa. The three species, <laughs> Montandonia, sp2, and uh, tibetensis, appeared as successively branched lineages in the basal clays. The remaining species formed two sister groups. Morcosis is sister to SP1, and Baradotki is sister to Lindemarie. For the species of species limitation, both the distance-based method ABGD and the multi-local-based method BPP retrieved seven OTUs that corresponded well with the morphologic taxa. <laughs> the tree-based methods PTP and uh, GMYC yield a high number of OTUs. The BPTP retrieved eight OTUs and split linearly into two OTUs. The discordance between the BPTP and the morphologic methods may be because the BPTP tends to overestimate the numbers of species when using multiple sequences per population. For GMYC, Brazotki and Linovari were separated into three and two OTUs, respectively. GMYC, GMYC usually over species, mainly due to low genetic divergence between lineages and overlap of inter- and uh, intraspecific divergences. Although these different methods failed, <laughs> failed to produce an identical number of OTUs, our methods supported that the individuals the, indi the individuals from the two potential new species were defined as uh, independent OTUs. We then re examine the results of phylogeny and the species limitation using digitalized data. The N tree revealed seven clays corresponding to five described species and two potential new species. Montandonia has the largest distance with the remaining species followed by P2. Barzotki has, has a close relationship with the linearity. Marcosis and P1 are closely related species. The N tree based on the DDRS data revealed similar topologic relationships with that of mitochondrial genome data. Montandonia located at the base branch of the NJ tree, followed by P2. Baradotsky and, uh, Baradotsky and Linovari consented a uh, sister clade and the last branch compared to topologic relationships reconstructed by mitochondrial genome data. The clade consisted of dependencies and the clade consisted of morcosis and P1 switched their positions. <laughs> Our PCA results show that the two potential new species at P1 and at P2 each consisted an independent cluster. We then conducted the BFD analysis to examine different methods of species diversity. Model A represents that there are seven species in the genus. Both at P1 and, and at P2 should be defined as new species. Model B represents that there are six species in the genus. Only at P1 should be defined as a new species. Model C represents that there are six species in the genus. Only at P2 should be defined as a new species. Model D represents that there are five species in the genus, both at P1 and at P2 shouldn't defend as new species. Our results show that the model A has the smallest M1 value, which is the best model. And the BRF values are larger than 200, indicating that the results are significant. We then, can, we then reconstructed a species tree Based on, the, based on the seven species model. The topologic is consistent with the phylogenetic tree based on mitochondrial genome data. Then we calculated the pairwise FST 
to assess the levels of genetic differentiation among species. Montedonia exhibits the largest genetic differentiation with the, with the remaining species. Both the two potential new species share a large degree of genetic differentiation with other species. Finally, based on the integrative results of the morphology, mitochondrial genome, and nuclear data, we defined the SP1 and SP2 as two new species of the genus Potometra. We named SP1 as Potometra Anderson in honor of the late Professor Anderson for his great contributions to the search and semi aquatic at Hedoptera. We named SP2 as Potometra Jinji in honor of Professor Lei Zheng for his outstanding contributions to the studies on Hedoptera. We provide the detailed descriptions of these two new species in our paper. And, uh, <coughs> and thus, there are seven described species in the genus. Um, of partial species of the genus. A general rearrangement event happened in the region of Tierra F and Tierra F and ND5. Both two species, Brazotki and Linovari, the gene order of their mitochondrial genome is typical. We identified two Tierra genes separated by the intergenic spacer in the remaining five species. And we named this species as IGS. The two TRF genes are absolutely identical and both might be functional genes. The results of the sequence alignment showed that the IGS had high similarity with the sequence of ND5. We speculated that the IGS was the pseudo gene of the ND5 due to the location and the high sequence similarity. We then speculated on the in terms of this rearrangement, based on the results of sequence alignment and the position of IGS and the TRF, TRF. We speculated that this gene rearrangement could be explained by the, t by the tandem duplication and the random loss model. First, the tandem duplication occurred in the TRF ND5 region and generated two sets of the same gene region. Then the ND5, the ND5 was randomly eliminated and become a pseudogene, which shaped the IGS during subsequent evolutionary events. Finally, the actual TRF and the IGS returned and, for, and formed a novel gene order. Finally, I would like to make a brief conclusion of our work. The species boundaries in the genus were, were determined by combining morphological characters and the molecular delimitation methods. The samples distributed in the south of the Serum Basin were defined as two new species, which were named and described. The phylogenetic relationships among potomatural species were revealed based on mitochondrial genome and the DRI data. Mitochondrial gene rearrangements were observed in the five species of potomatra, and the rearrangement mechanism could be explained by the TDRL model. For future directions, we found that the species of potomatra mainly distributed around the stream basin with a ring shaped manner. The genetic pattern and species and speciation process may be interesting. Next, we will explore the evolutionary history of potomatra species, revealing the origin and the expansion rules. In addition, the species Barzotsky is much more widely distributed than other species in the genus. The genetic pattern within this species is still unclear. We will, we will explore the genetic pattern of this widely distributed species. I would like to, I would like to acknowledge my advisor, Professor Wen Junbu, for his guidance and help. And this work was funded by the National Natural Science Foundation of China. Thanks for your attention. Okay, that's all. Thank you. If you have any questions, I will try to answer. Thank you very much. I don't think we have time for questions right now, but. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, people can email you questions if they have any. Yeah, we'll know the symposium later as well, so we can have questions during that time.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll be hearing from David Armisen on uh, his work with transcriptome-based phylogeny of the semi-aquatic bugs, a Hemiptera heteroptera geromorpha. So, hello everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you and present you this, this uh, work we've been doing during the last years. And it's very exciting also because um, I'm learning a lot about taxonomy because um, we are uh, working in a, work in a lab that is mostly interested in us studying evolution uh, from a genetic point of view. So we are trying to understand where the genetic uh, mechanisms that underlie the evolution of some adaptive traits. And that's how we got interested on the geomorpha so long time ago, like 10 years ago, we got first interested on how these uh, bugs have made to, um, the transition from uh, land to water. And we were interested in studying how um, um, they have evolved such like, uh, long legs and how have they have changed the body plan. So now the um, mid legs are longer than the hind legs. So we started, like I said, like 10 years ago, and we started studying what are the genetic mechanisms. So by the time we were using a um, um, candidate gene approach that allows us to identify one of the genes that is involved in such log like elongation, but then we started to um, move on to more uh, transcriptomic comparative analysis, which uh, allow us to identify new genes that are involved in leg elongation. And by the time we were so hooked on this uh, such cool uh, family that we start to look at other adaptations that occur around the geromorpha. So for example, we got interested in the study the uh, Ragovili fan, which is, Abdul is gonna give you a talk later about that. We were also interested in looking at those pigmentation that we can see on the embryos of many of the species. Um, we keep being interested on looking at the leg elongation, but from a um, sexual conflict point of view. In this case, you have this microbial longibus with this huge hyperallometry, and we did uh, also a comparative transcriptomic analysis to identify the genes that underlie such um, leg elongation. So we did that not only in one species, but in many cases, once we identify which is the gene that's involved in a particular adaptation, like in this case, um, UBX, we keep going and uh, test what's the function and expression of these genes in other species through the phylogeny of the geromorpha, so we can get a better understanding on how these uh, adaptations have evolved. So, but uh, by generating all these um, analyses, uh, we started to build our own little um, phylogenies for the genes that we're interested on, um, and at some point we realized that we have been generating a lot of transcriptomic data for our comparative analysis. So at some point we realized we have 19.5 complete transcriptome for species all across the tree of the geromorpha and we have started to generate uh, whole uh, sequencing data. So 
we decided that it could be cool to um, use all this data to, more, to do a more comprehensive uh, phylogeny reconstruction, which help, can help us to uh, better infer some of this um, the evolution of some of those genes, because there were some nodes where we still doubts about um, what was the ancestral state. So how we did that? So what we did is we took all this transcriptomic data and basically we used a clustering uh, method to generate uh, orthologue groups of orthologue genes. And then we used IQ3 to do the three reconstructions. So at the end we used uh, 686 gene blocks that accounts for 200 and 500 250,000 uh, nucleotides, more or less, only position one and two, and then we generate a very nice tree, which you don't see anything because it's very small and nasty. So you probably don't see the name of all the species that we use, but here you have color a nice uh, tree or nicer tree where you can see all the relationships that we found out uh, among the germorph families. And we found out that there were three main results that um, uh, we weren't expecting or shocked us, shocked us a little bit at the beginning. So first thing is that we saw that the hydrometer was basal to the mesovelidae and the hybridae, which is um, different to the classical view of uh, hybridae, basal, and then mesovelidae, hydrometer. And also linked with that, we see that there's been an early split of the geridae and the velidae from the hydrometridae, mesovelidae, and, and hybridae. Um, which is the point two. And the last thing that uh, we were um, interested to see is that there was, we found there was a sister relationship between the geridae um, and the microvellini and the halovellini. So the microvellini that you have here in light, up, sorry, here, it was sister to the geridae and not part of the validae family. So at that point we decided that we want to check for the results we have obtained and we start with the easy one. So I here just removed the, the colors of the subfamily, so it's easier for you to follow out what I'm talking about. So if we took the third point, so the um, microvillini being sister to the rest of the geomorpha, it's actually not a, a new new uh, result. So we see that in Damgar in 2008 already found this relationship, although he didn't suggest to move the microvillini from, from, from the belly day to the, to the jerry day, which is something we might propose. Um, and then the next thing is we were mostly worried about or worried. We were mostly interested to, to verify that this early speed that we see at this um, uh, early, um, uh, well, sorry, I lost my word. So we were mostly interested to see if this early split of the valley danger for the rest of the geomorpha was actually um, real result it was some kind of artificial result of the method that we have used. So what we did is that we verified our method and we checked two different uh, things. First, the way we construct uh, the uh, gene clusters that we're using to do the uh, reconstruction of the phylogeny. So we use OrthoFinder, we use Silix, which is another method to uh, build clusters, and we use Buscus because Buscus normally is for unique uh, genes that are in single copy, so that could help us to get rid of any duplication that can um, introduce some inconsistencies in the tree. And then we decided to use not only nucleotide data, but also the amino acid data uh, using maximum likelihood method with IQ3 and also uh, maximum parsimonic reconstruction using TNT. And up here you have it in color. So basically, it, uh, what this figure shows is that no matter which uh, method we use to build the clusters of the genes, and no matter which method we use to reconstruct the tree, all these uh, major relationships that I, fall, I show you are um, consistent. So we always find this early split, we always find this either method to be basal to heavy day and mesovelli day. And we always have find this um, uh, sister relationship with the micro, between the microvilla and, and the and the jerry day. Uh, the last thing we did, um, the last thing we did is that we wanted to be 100% sure. So we used these four clusters of likelihood map mapping, which allow us to test for these different topologies. So I just up uh, translate that to something that's more visual to you, so you, in the top, you have what we have 
found. So you have a validate that split early from the hydrometide and the mesovalide. Down in the corner left, you have what's more the classical view, that like you have the outgroup, then the mesovalide, mesovalide and hybridae, and hydrometide from which validae and geridae um, diverge. And then you have another possibility, which is just that hydrometide is basal to everything. And what we found out is actually that 76% um, of the reconstructions actually support um, the idea that there was an early split in the, in the evolution. But we still find like 23% of, of those results that um, support the idea that the mesovalidae every day are, vas um, are basal and then hydrometidae uh, it's derived and the validae and geridae derived from it. So I think that this, this actually shows us that um, um, some of the genes that we have in our uh, data set have a particular um, evolutionary story. So I think that's important to include as many data as we have. Um, the last thing is that, um, uh, as similar as I showed you before, this is not totally new neither, because um, there's been a couple of publications, like uh, uh, working on the phylogeny, uh, phylogenomics of uh, Hemitra, that also use transcriptomic data, and they have very similar results as we got, although this was uh, probably not the main uh, objective to, to do the reconstruction of the phylogeny of the, of the geromorpha. So here you see, for example, you, the early split again, you have the jerry there that split very early from the hydrometide and the mesovalide. Uh, you also have this uh, reconstruction wave one, who have the same thing, you have the early split here, and then again, hydrometride is basal to both um, heavy day and mesovalide. Yep. And um, yeah, so the results we found are consistent, no matter the method. It, they are also consistent with some of the, of the previous uh, published work. And now that we have that, the main aim we have in the lab, as I told you, is to understand how some of these traits have evolved. So for example, now, we are, if we look back at this relative black length, which was the original reason we started to study about this work, uh, of this um, uh, box, we see that uh, the, uh, the derived uh, mode of all locomotion and the, and the inversion of the relative black length occur very early uh, during the evolution. So uh, probably very quickly when this uh, back started to Backs start to move from land to water, they quickly diverge from shore to the more um, open water where they have to um, this derived mode of locomotion of rowing instead of walking. The other thing that we were interested on, we did a number of these um, ancestral reconstructions, is um, real leg modification. So in this case, what we were interested on is that uh, in many species, we can see that the real leg have been modified. So the males have evolved structures that can help them to mate and to uh, increase the mating rate. And we have uh, actually uh, mapped those to see how many of those uh, events are independent. And also, regardless of, so we have a number of them, but the most interesting thing for the lab is that now we can test them up with RNAi and you don't see it, but um, we can knock down UBX and we can see that many of these modifications are actually underlying the same genetic mechanism, at least um, partially, let's say, so not partially. That's, UBX is one of the main drivers of like modification, so it's, it's involved in many of those uh, uh, modifications that we can observe. Lastly, the last thing we can do is we also do the uh, dating of the tree. So this is also something we did, and we didn't find major uh, difference here. So we still find the geromorpha like the bird like 200 million years ago. Um, this is pretty similar to what we already had. But overall, um, what I try to present to you here is that we can use transcriptomic data at the whole level to try to rebuild the phylogeny of the geromorpha that does allow us to establish new relationship with very strong support. And the results are consistent, no matter the method we use, but there's still some incompleteness in the tree. So for example, we have three missing major missing families that we are missing. So we're missing Macrovelidae, Paraphrenovelidae, and hermat Hermatovetidae. And the other thing is that our tree is quite heavily biased towards South American 
North American and a few of European species. So sure, it could be always be improved by adding those species from Asia, uh, Oceania, and Africa. So uh, of course, this is uh, the work I'm presented to you here, but it's not only me who's been involved in this project. It's been a major project, mostly past members have collaborated with um, generating all the data and uh, obtaining the samples. And um, I would like to thank you all of them and also the funding agencies that allow us to make all this work. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Nice talk. Um, so you tried all the different methods of analyzing the data set, but did you also try different alignments to see if how that might have affected the data? Uh, actually, it's, it's yes, in part, because every time that we use, we use three methods to define the clus clustering the genes. Mm -hmm. So in each case was a different alignment, because okay. it was a different set of genes that was retained. So well. yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Next, we'll be hearing from Abdera Abderrahman Kila. Sorry if I'm okay. Good. No, it was perfect. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, and he'll be speaking on the origin of evolutionary innovations from cell and developmental biology to trait utility and diversification. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's very exciting to be here. So, um, really, my great thanks to the organizers for allowing me to, to give this talk. Um, it's also great to talk after many previous talks from Wuju and his colleague and from David who already set the stage for some of the stuff I'm going to say. So um, my talk is interested in evolutionary innovations um, and I will tell you more about that but before, uh, of course these are the great people who past and, and present members of the lab who have been in, involved in this project. Um, so as you know, Jerome Mofa live on the water surface. And this is a, a lifestyle that is uh, uh, accompanied by many new challenges. So these animals are being attacked from all kinds of fronts. And uh, also they have to adapt to a very challenging environment in terms of locomotion and in terms of many different aspects. So here there is jump-in behavior to escape predation uh, that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. And uh, that's how selection works. And um, we are uh, interested in uh, all kinds of aspects in terms of finit phenotypes or traits that allow this lifestyle to actually occur and to drive diversification of the group. So let's go back to the concept of, of evolutionary innovations. So this is a very important concept, uh, especially to people interested in evolutionary biology or in evolutionary developmental biology, which is the community that we uh, mostly um, are active, active in. Um, this concept is very old. It has been defined many times. There are all kinds of definitions. But those definitions uh, usually uh, take into account three main aspects. Phylogenetic aspect, uh, uh, organismal or functional aspect, and also the impact of these traits on diversification. And usually they are known to be involved in rapid diversification and speciation and radiation. So there are many examples. Um, the eye, evolution of eyes, is one example. Feathers, flight, uh, turtle shells, there are all kinds of examples. And these are quite, uh, quite uh, well known and studied. But many of them are difficult to manipulate and are also difficult to, to, go, to go deeper into the mechanism. 
uh, that, that actually um, help these, these, uh, these in innovations um, emerge and evolve. So in the lab, we got into water striders mainly because some of the, the traits that they bear, and one of them is this uh, striking propelling fan uh, that, that we heard about earlier. So the pro propelling fan, propelling fan is, a, is a cuticular structure that is found in the second leg of all Ragovilia genus, so all species have it without any exception. And it's quite striking because you don't, you can't explain the presence of this structure by, by descent from a common ancestor because the ancestor of these bugs didn't have it and that's part of the definition of evolutionary innovations. So Ragovilia is, is, a, is a lineage or if it's a genus that is known to live in streams or fast flowing streams sometimes. And that's what you see in this video here. So the one on the left is normal uh, speed, the one on the right is, by, uh, is, is, is in slow motion. And you see that the animal pushes in the water and it deploys this structure to actually help it to push against the water. Uh, we, uh, uh, earlier we heard, we heard a bit more details about how this, how this works in, 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 in biomechanical terms. So what is the origin of this, of this kind of structure? So if we think about the evolutionary origin, so here's a very simplified phylogeny. So the fan occurs exclusively in the subfamily Ragovilliinae, which contains three genera. There's Chenevilia, which only includes one species, and it has two pairs of fans that looks almost like a, um, a kind of a Christmas tree shape that you see here. Then there's Tetraeropis, which has a few species. And they also have two pairs of fans that you can see this uh, bushy-like structure. And then you have Ragovilia, which includes over 400 species. And they, has, they have this plumy fan that you see, that this, this quite elaborate and complex structure. So if you look closer at this uh, phylogeny, what you will realize is that in the family Veliidae, there are about 60 genera and 900 species, and half of the species count of the family is accounted for by the Ragovilia genus. So we think this is an example of, of explosion or adaptive radiation where there's a, a large number of species that evolved in, in a kind of a short period of time. And they all, all of them have the fan without any exception, and they all specialize in fast flowing streams. So there are many questions surrounding the origin of evolutionary innovations. This depends on which field uh, you are on and which kind of, uh, uh, of, of methods you want to use. In, in, in our lab, we try to be as integrative as we can. And there are many levels of, of organization from genes, for what kind of genes, what kind of mutations occurred and have been selected positively and led to the innovation. How are these genes arranged or organized into interactive networks uh, in the tissues? How do they act on cell identity, cell, uh, um, cell biology, and how do they actually translate into the, into the trait? And how does this trait affect the biology of the organism, its diversification, its functioning, its ecology, etc., etc.? So they are all very important, very interconnected questions that we are trying to answer with this fan as, as a model. One of the first experiments we've done in the lab regarding this is to try to uncover what kind of genes and what kind of gene function during development makes this structure or, or helps shape this structure. And one of the uh, techniques we use is comparative transcriptomics. And it's, you, think, you can think about it simply, all cells in an, organisms in an organism have exactly the same genes, but all cells don't activate the same genes. And if we can detect which genes are active in the cells that make the structure, then we can probably find out which genes uh, do this. And one way to do it is you take a leg with a fan and a leg without a fan, you grind them, you make RNA and you sequence it and you compare everything that's common between these two legs you throw away and everything that's different you start to make hypotheses about how it can contribute. That's what you see in this, in this uh, heat map, yeah, first leg, second leg and third leg and when you analyze in this graph here, the middle are the, third, uh, are the second legs, the one with the fan and all these genes you see here in gray are more active in the leg with the fan compared to the legs without the fan. And then you can actually even 
kind of sort this out and, and, and remove some positive, f false positives, etc. And you will end with this graph here with only a few genes that might be, uh, might be involved. So this is still kind of in silico analysis. It doesn't really tell you about the real biology. But the real biology, when you start to go to the eggs, when the fans start to develop, and you start to mark them and see which gene is active and which gene is not. And that's what you see in this picture here. This is an embryo of Ragovilia that we cut with here. We're showing only the legs. You take it out of its shell and you mark it with a technique. And if you get a pattern like what you see here in this tip of the second leg, you see that, that dark dot? That is mRNA being detected in a, in a number of cells at the part of the leg where the fan is going to develop. So that's kind of very interesting result because it tells us that most likely these genes are going to be involved. What was interesting also is that among the genes we found, there were two genes that were unknown and that were very similar to each other, which at the end would turn out that they were paralogs, a result of a gene duplication. And when we analyzed, that's what you see in this phylogeny here, there are two copies, one in gray, and it's common to all semi-aquatic insects, whether they have fans or not. And you see the sample here, that's uh, with this sample of Ragovilia. And then there is a second copy in, in green here that is exclusive to the Ragovilia genus. You don't find it anywhere else. So what we concluded from this is that there are two main events. The first one is that there are a certain number of genes that got activated in the cells that will make the fan, and that's what you see in the picture in the middle. And the second event is that some of them are a result of a gene duplication that happened at the, at the node where Ragovilia diverged from other lineages. So it's kind of a big smoking gun. Because those genes were not known, we needed to find names for them. So most of you name species, we name also genes. So one of the ideas was, because the fan looks like the Japanese geisha fan, we called them geisha for the new copy and mother of geisha for the, uh, for the uh, ancestral copy. So all this is good, but it doesn't tell us if these genes are really the ones that make the fan. And to know that, you, we need to break them we need to deplete them or inactivate them. And if they are involved, normally we should lose the fan, or at least we should have some sort of effect on the fan. And that's exactly what you see in this picture. So control would be here. And this is uh, the fan of individuals to which we broke geisha and mother of geisha. And what you can see is that the claws, the, these two big structures, these are the claws, they are completely unaffected, but the fan is heavily depleted. And almost lost. So this really tells us that these two genes are required during development to make the fan. And because there is the result of gene duplication that is specific to Ragovilia, it also told, tells us that gene duplication led to this one new copy that itself led to this new uh, structure or this evolutionary innovation. So this is kind of organismal level. Now you can ask, okay, what kind of cells express these genes and how do they make the fan? And one of the first ways to know that is to go deeper in detail. And this is some more kind of cell biology with confocal microscopy. What you see in this picture in blue, these are nuclei. So these are, these are all nuclei of a leg. And that's just the tip of the mid leg. And you see this big cell here. The green is geisha, is the mRNA of the gene geisha. And you can see that it's exclusively expressed in one cell at the tip of the leg. You see that little eye you see there? That's the nucleus of that cell. And it's much bigger than the surrounding nuclei. This tells us that the fan is made by a single cell, which is very striking in this kind of examples. And this cell is polyploid because it has a, a, a big, a big nu nucleus. When the embryo gets a little older, older, the cell starts to stretch and it's kind of followed its shape of the leg. And then it produces a massive amount of cuticular, cuticular uh, uh, material. We know this because there are many gene, cuticular genes that are expressed also in this cell. And you can confirm this by just marking the, the membranes of cells. You can see this big cell in the middle here. So that is really striking. The other question you can ask if you are interested, uh, like us, in, in how these things develop and evolve, you can ask, well, why is the second leg have a fan and a big cell and, and the other legs don't? How do you restrict this structure to one leg and not in the other? 
And that usually happens by interaction between genes. Some genes will allow it to be there, some genes will stop it from being there. And we wanted to understand how these dynamics work. So one of our usual suspects are Hox genes. If you're not familiar with Hox genes, these are very conserved genes, they are transcription factors. We have them, insects have them, and they are the genes that make sure the head is in its place, the leg is in its place, and the toes are in their place, etc. So they kind of give identity to the different segments along the body. If you look, this is an embryo again of Ragovilia, and the colors, the red, that's the first leg, and it expresses a Hox gene called sex combs reduced. The, the white is the third leg, and it expresses another Hox gene called orthrobithorax, or UBX. And then the mid leg, it expresses UBX, but it's very, very faint. And you see in green, the little dot here, that's geisha. So it looks like the mouse and cat game. Whenever a Hox gene is present, geisha is absent. Whenever a Hox gene is absent, geisha is present. So this is an indication that these genes may be repress the fate of cells that will give the fan. And we wanted to test that. And one way to test that again is if you remove the, you can remove the cat and see if the mice will show up. And that's exactly what we did. If you break UBX, if UBX represses geisha, then when you break it, geisha should appear. And that's what you see here in this picture. So this is a normal animal. This is the second leg. You see the big cell here in the middle in green. The third leg doesn't have anything. And then when we repress UBX, then you have geisha that stays in the second leg but then you have it again that appears in the third leg. What this tells us is that these Hox genes make sure that the first leg and the third leg don't have fans and let the second leg have fan. And that's very important because otherwise it will be a problem for the animal to have three fans because it wouldn't be able to, to function. To further confirm this, what we did is we blocked these genes and let the animals develop. And the idea is, will they make fans in, in places where they are not supposed to? So what you see in these pictures here, this is the system in the first leg. These are the two claws and there is an aerolium in the middle. The third leg again has two claws and an aerolium. The second legs have the two claws but the fan instead of an aerolium. So one of the ideas is that the fan originates from the aerolium, so basically just a modified aerolium. So now when we break UBX and sex comes reduced, in the first leg when we break sex comes reduced, we have an aerolium that now starts to look like a fan. So this confirms what we have been seeing in, in cell biology experiments. In the third leg, sorry, in the third leg, if you break UBX, again, you have the aerolium, that now becomes a fan. But in the second leg, nothing happens. So this again confirms that those genes allow the fan to develop, and when they are expressed, how much time I have? I have three minutes. When, when they are present, they block the development of this structure, and when they are absent, they allow the structure. And that's how we get one fan in the middle of the legs. It would be interesting to know what's happening in the other species that have two pairs in the second and third leg. Last thing, which I will try to do as quick as I can, is what's the role of the fan during locomotion? So we saw some biomechanics, and now I want to tell you some uh, at the organismal level. So the Ragovilia, again, they are fast moving, they move all the time, and they are in streams. And here in the right, this, this is a sister species uh, called Stridulovilia. These are sympatric species. They will be on the same streams, but Ragovilia would be in the middle where there is current, and Stridulovilia will be on the margins, always associated with plants, etc. And you can see here, they will only move from point A to point B if they want to, whereas in Ragovilia, Ragovilia they are on movement all the time. So to test this, what we did, we generated four groups. Stridulovilia, which naturally don't have fans, Ragovilia with normal fans, Ragovilia where we surgically removed the fans, we left the claws and removed the fans, and then Ragovilia where we inactivate the genes, so we don't completely remove the fan, we still keep some remnants of it. And we tested these groups in a calm water. This is where Stridulovilia normally would live, so there is no challenge, no stream. What was very surprising to us is that Stridulovilia, which doesn't have fans, is the fastest. So that means the fan doesn't necessarily increase speed. The three Ragovilia groups are as fast, no matter what, whether they have fan or, or, or not. But when we start to look at stroke frequency, so the number of strokes per unit of time they make, turns out those that are fast, it's because they work hard. 
And those to which we remove the fan, they work the hardest to be uh, as fast as, as they are. And the ones with intermediate fan, they are always intermediate. So now what we did, we challenged them. Now we put them in a, in a current where we can control uh, the water speed. And the way we did it is we created a tunnel, we created a canal, and there's a bucket, there's a pump, and they have to go against current. If they go to the upstream bucket, they are winners. If they go to the downstream bucket, they get washed. They are losers, and we count time, etc. This is how it looks in real life. So that's in, uh, in with high-speed camera. And then we took the animals, so there's the control on top. These are the ones with reduced fans in the bottom. You can see the control zips without any problem. But then the ones where the fan is reduced, it, it, ha it struggles and keeps going up and down, up and down for five, 10 minutes until it gets exhausted and it falls. We quantified this, and that's what you see in this graph. This is my last slide, I promise. When we quantified this, what you see in this graph here, the numbers, the percentages, are the percentage of animals that make it to the upper bucket. And Stridulovilia, which is the one that is the fastest in calm water, they can't cope with current. Just give them current, they can't cope with it at all. Raguvilia, all of them make it. The ones who remove the fan, only 40% make it. And the ones, again, where they have remnants of the fan, they are, again, intermediate. They can make it, it takes them more time and less of them make it. Which probably tells us that these kind of ev evolutionary innovations, they probably start with some rudiment in the lag and then they keep getting perfected as time goes because selection is, is constant. Water current probably from 20 million years ago has been constant. They had to deal with the same challenge and therefore this, the structure it keeps, getting, keeps getting perfected as, until we see it as, as, as it is today. I will stop here. Again, thanks to all the people who did the work and gave the money, and thank you for your attention. So thank you to all the speakers this afternoon, and thank you to the both uh, chairperson, Samantha and Pablo. Thank you very much for the job. And now, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then the Geremorpha Symposium uh, can begin. Please, uh, Lana and Felipe.
we will always remember that he was one of the founders of this research. Now, some of the talks, we didn't really have time to ask questions. But if there are no questions, what Felipe and I thought is that probably what we can do is ask the speakers to come up and say that what they would want to do in the future, you know, and see whether the Thank audience you. would have um, uh, suggestions for them. How about that? <laughs> Has anybody got questions they would really like to ask to any one of the speakers when they didn't have opportunity to ask during the talk? Just raise your hand. Oh, okay. Um, I have a question on Vagovilia. Maybe it's easier to yeah. shout than using the speaker. <laughs> okay, well, I think it will work. So, so you made a superb case for the fan potentially being a, or being a key innovation, let's put it that way, uh, for Vagovilia. But then what do you think has driven really the speciation? Because that's just the first step, right? And then we have 400 species all across the world. So what do you think has driven that? Uh, I would love to answer your question. I, I don't have the answer. Um, uh, from what we see in our phylogeny, is it seems like a, a rapid radiation. But this needs to be tested formally. And, and we need much larger sampling to test that. Um, in my, I, I'm not a believer in one thing driving the whole thing. Uh, I, I think the fan most likely contributed the uh, Ragovilla is different in many ways. I think if you look at the legs of Ragovilla, they're much bulkier, much thicker. In my opinion, they're full of muscles because when you have a structure like that, it ha you, and the animal needs to have muscles to move it because otherwise it's going to be very difficult. So I think probably where Ragovilla succeeded, where others didn't, is that the, it managed to get to a niche that is very challenging and that others can't get to. Very, very few germophobes can get to that. And I think the fan is part of it, but most likely many other things are also part of it. Any more hands? There was Over there. Well, there. Oh. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so it's more on the bioacoustic side. So uh, I saw that you studied Strigulivilia. So I know that not all species have the stridulatory mechanism, but from a bioacoustic perspective, uh, have you had the chance to study um, the behavioral context of stridulation? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, also, a question in terms of the expression of the genes. Um, it was really quite impressive to see how it works. Ah, Do I got a question now. Okay. Uh, close the mic, Carla. <laughs> Sorry? Somebody on Zoom is, has an open mic. Someone is talking in the Zoom. Can I continue? Hi, Carla. <laughs> okay. Um, do you really know the exact factor which is interacting with the gene in order to become expressed? So on a molecular level, because this will be really interesting to know. I think it's, it's really a hard task to identify it and uh, maybe even to get 3D models or whatever about this, this, this really, really interesting um, process. But I'm really interested to think of think fingers or something in this way. Are you on it? <laughs> yeah. no, no, really. So, yes, a very important question. So, right, that, so the, the genes are, are uh, signaling molecules. So those are signaling molecules, for those not in, uh, um, familiar with this, they are genes that convey some sort of signal across cells, but they don't interact physically to activate or repress other genes. Those would be transcription factors. We are looking for those, and we are using uh, single cell transcriptomics to do that, and there are ways to generate data from each cell and to reconstruct networks. 
at least in silico, you can reconstruct it, this gene, control this gene, etc., etc., and then you can go to the bench and test each of these. So we're very much interested in that, but we still have a lot of work to do to get there. You can see better than I can. <laughs> oh, did I walk past it? I thought. Sorry. Ladies, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I don't work in Geromorpha, but um, has anybody kind of taken up the opportunity to the fact that of a global issue right now, right, is freshwater availability? And for example, in the United States, a lot of fast moving streams like the Rio Grande, the Colorado River are all getting dammed and you're creating a lot of stagnant water sources that a lot of these fast flowing stream dependent species are getting threatened. So um, I, don't, I don't know if that's something as a community, are you, is there a lot of work being done to do conservation? Because again, insects in general are kind of ignored for the most part, but um, that seems to be like a really key group that would be impacted by climate change. So, um, other people looking? I mean, who's working on it? I hope that. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, is Leticia there? So uh, my PhD student there, she's uh, working on biogeography and niche modeling. And she's going to do it for the neotropics as a whole, for all species across Euromorpha. So it's 600 something species. And the idea is to first define what are the main Endemis, uh, areas for endemism, and which are the areas that are really important in terms of preserving and conservation mm -hmm. uh, across the continent. And then she's going to model uh, current distribution patterns and then with two degrees more and four degrees more and see where we, lo we lose more fauna. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's, it's being done. So Good. It's a work in progress. Glad you're working on it. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, uh, it maybe not uh, doesn't have much to do with Geromorpha probably, but I keep on thinking on your amazing talk on um, on the fan of the Ragovelia, because uh, I was uh, I've been studying the pretarsal structures of um, different Hemipterans, and this study is like very very interesting example of uh, discovering the genetic background of it, which can help homologize, and it's the first step. So it's not like the solution yet, but it's a very interesting first step. So, have you think, have you thought of like expanding these studies on pretarsal structures and other hemipterans and uh, other heteropterans? So the reason why it's interesting to expand is because one of our main objectives is to try to get some general principles, not something specific to this species. That What can we learn that can be generalized? And you can only do this by expanding to other lineages. The reason why I said yes and no, but the no part is because it's not easy. Uh, and I think, I think that will come for sure, but we have to be very selective. First, we need to understand some basic things and then go and check if we can find them in, in other, other places. Thank you. Uh, well, I was amazed by your talk as well. And uh, I was amazed also by the uh, biomechanics uh, works from the uh, from the uh, Vujue and Sankun. And I would like to ask whether uh, you've considered some like uh, ethological or more like ecological uh, convergences uh, in species of uh, other valley there, which also inhabit like fast flowing streams. Uh, for example, because only Ragovelia has this uh, big fan, but uh, other species of valley they live in like fast uh, flowing streams. And for example, in Velia, as far as I know, that there is uh, like a mechanism of uh, propelling itself forward with the uh, uh, water surface. Uh, yeah, 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 you know what I'm talking about. Mar 
Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to get the cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, like, um, anti predatory convergences in, for, for example, the, the Gerida, as we've heard, they can jump away from the fish. Uh, while I believe valley they cannot jump, or I have never seen them to do it, but the, they are toxic and they have like aposematic coloration of uh, the abdomen. And whether there are like some other uh, such nice convergences, for example, between other species in uh, worldwide that you would uh, be thinking about. For example, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, a lineage called Husiella, so it's a microvillinae, if I, if I remember correctly. So they, the fan is, is not, uh, the, the, the aureolium is not transformed into a fan, but it's a blade. It's a sh can, and the claws themselves are a shape of blade and they get deployed and they have the same effect. There's one thing I, I personally observed, but we haven't published it. It's, there's a species called the cylinder status and it's also a large stream species. And the juveniles have something that the adults don't, which is a transformation of a claw. A claw they almost have a triangular shape, like a, like a blade of an oar, and for the exact same effect. So I think many lineages, they didn't converge to the exact same structure, but they converged to solutions that were triggered by the same selective pressures. That would be very interesting to look at. We haven't looked at it yet, but it, 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 we should. We definitely should. I don't know if Wojo, you want to add something? No. <laughs> so uh, I think that if we don't have really any questions, we can we can move uh, for dinner because it's, it's everybody's tired. <laughs> I, I, it's a big a big day for water strategies already. Uh, so uh, I think we're okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Please. So maybe, maybe some words. Um, I think we are now on a stage where we have really a lot of people who are interested in the phylogeny of the Geromorpha. And we have a lot of approaches and a lot of data. And I think we are now in the stage that we can combine all this stuff to get a really comprehensive and detailed phylogeny of the Geromorpha. We are close to this. And I think we can do it in the near future. If we combine all our efforts, we can solve this problem. We will be able to see that the validae are paraphyletic. In, in terms from taxonomic, we need some more detailed information about it. We cannot say the validae are paraphyletic, the validae are paraphyletic, the validae are paraphyletic. I don't care about it anymore, yeah? <laughs> we, have, we have to say we have now this group, we have this group, we have this group from a taxonomic perspective. This is really important and we are on the way and we are close to the target to do this. And if we do it, we will be really reach a benchmark within entomology in this context. Combining also the, uh, the, the, the ecological processes which uh, stimulated it and I think this is now the stage to do it. Mm -hmm. If I may just yeah, add yeah, something yeah, yeah, to, this, to this, I, I, I completely agree. Um, I, I think, of course, the time was taken. But my suggestion is, uh, if we can find time for those who are interested to get together around the beer and talk about this topic, how we can do it, because I think if we combine our effort, we can do much more than what we are doing right now, and probably in a more organized way. So my suggestion is people interested, uh, I don't know, maybe you, Felipe, or, or Lana, we can, we can get together at some point yeah, and, and just talk we about can, this. We can go right now afterwards and, and, and discuss, uh, drink something, okay? You have the possibility to go downstairs. There's a private room if you wish. We made the reservation for it, knowing that these kind of situations could happen. I strongly recommend that you go outside, grab a couple of beers, yes, yes. enjoy the afternoon, and discuss over there with a couple yes. of beers. But the possibility to go downstairs in a private room is, is there. Yeah. Just to let you know. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I think for the phylogeny part, we are not that many people. Uh, there's quite a few. and. A, a round of beer would be the ideal solution for this. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, would you? Yeah. 
No, no, don't be sorry. <laughs> I just a uh, simple question for uh, Professor Lana Cheng, to, since she knows well about halobatis. Because when I see the, the leg proportion of halobatis, the, they looks like they also have long foreleg, like Petulum tigrina. But in well, my uh, research, they, the smaller species doesn't need to have that long foreleg. So maybe you have some idea why they have that much long foreleg? So uh, usually the smaller species don't need to have a really long foreleg, but halobates proportionally seems to have one, if you know how, how come. That's your, your long elongation gene comes in. <laughs> you know, they have very long middle legs because they have to move and be very strong. This is the moving leg in halobates. The front legs are only used for holding prey. So the middle leg is very important. So we have to do something about our elongation gene. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else want to add something? Uh, yeah, I think we can wrap up then. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, staying until the end. Yeah, we are happy for, with the, all the talks. Thank you, and thank you, Marcos, for hosting us.